Our next speaker is Petr Tsenkov from ETH Zurich. And if you've ever decompiled an Android application, you may have found uh, it's been obfuscated in some way and all of the variables and functions are letters, just single letters, and really hard to figure out what's going on in the code. Peter's gonna solve that problem for you. So, take it away. Thanks for the introduction. So yes, my name is Petr Tsenkov, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about the obfuscating Android applications. This is joint work with uh, Benjamin Bixel, uh, Vesilin Rajchev, and Martin Vechev. And before I begin talking about how do we do this, let me start with some motivation of why do we care about deobfuscating Android applications. So most of the Android applications today are distributed in the form of uh, Android binaries or APKs. For example, on Google Play, we have 2.4 million Android binaries. And if we want to have a look at the source code that was used to generate these binaries, then we don't have that. So, um, by the way, is it possible to make the slides bigger, probably? I don't know who is managing that. So if you want to get the source code, that's not possible. And um, in many cases, of course, it is useful to inspect what the source code does in order to understand what the application does. So let me show you how these, how these Android applications are generated. Uh, when we originally we start from the source code, and as a first step, before the, s the binary is generated, we generate, we apply something called layout obfuscation on the source code. So here is one example, and this is the most common type of uh, obfuscation performed uh, on the source code. So on the left we have the um, source code without obfuscation, and you see that we have proper names for variables, for class names, for method names. And it is very easy to understand what this application is doing. So we know that this, we have some application that handles some, uh, does some database functionality. And after obfuscation, we see that on the right, most of, most of the names are replaced with meaningless short names. So for example, the package name is removed, the class name is removed, the field, the method name, they're all replaced. And only some of the names remain. For example, if you have the class that belongs to an Android API, then those remain be because they cannot be obfuscated. And the problem is that it, if you look at the code on the right, it is very difficult to understand what this piece of code is doing. Now, this kind of obfuscation poses a number of challenges from a security point of view. As I already mentioned, if you want to inspect the code to understand what it's doing, so in the case of Android, this is very important because we have, uh, these applications have access to device sensors, sensitive information, so it is important to understand how they work with this, uh, with this data. Another critical problem in security is third party library detection. And the problem here is that once the, when the, after the obfuscation, all the application specific code is obfuscated together with the third party library code. So we cannot distinguish what kind of, li of libraries were imported in the application. And there are many other problems. For example, we have uh, statistical security systems that uh, rely on descriptive names in order to predict and to do their analysis. So all these uh, are different kinds of security challenges. All right, so we want to address this, this problem and the question that we ask in this here, in this project here is can we reverse layout obfuscation? And if we think about this problem it, intuitively, this is a very difficult thing to do. After we remove the original names from the code, then how can we recover them? This intuition is however wrong as we show. And in fact, we can deobfuscate, we can reverse the process of layout obfuscation with very high accuracy of 80%. And to show how we do this, we have built a system that does precisely this. It is called DGuard. And this system is publicly available. We have released it on uh, apkdguard.com. All right, so we released the system last week. And uh, since last week, we had uh, the system had uh, a number of several thousand users already. Many people uploaded their Android binaries in order to deobfuscate them. There were various tweets and discussions on Reddit about the system. People were discussing how, how is, it, is it possible to, do, to reverse layout obfuscation? How do we do this? And in our experiments, it is possible. We do it with very high accuracy. So I'm going to explain to you now how does this system work at a very high level. All right, so at the high level, the, the key point that makes this thing possible is that we already have a large number of unobfuscated open source applications. We have them on GitHub, on Bitbucket. So we can use these applications to train a probabilistic model that captures how names are assigned to program elements. And in particular, the way we do this is uh, we first do some static analysis in order to derive 
some representation, some semantic representation about these applications. And this we need simply because we cannot directly train on the source code. And also this representation has to be compatible with uh, whatever probabilistic model we want, we're going to use to, to train that. So after we have trained this probabilistic model, uh, this is done during the learning phase, it's done once and for all. Then we can use it to deobfuscate Android applications, and this is done during the prediction phase, which is done once for each application. In this prediction phase, we start with the obfuscated source code, we derived again this semantic representation about the application, so intuitively this captures the program elements and how they relate to one another. Then we query the, pr the probabilistic model to figure out what are the most likely names for the deobfuscated elements, and then we transform the application with the, ele with the names that we, that we predict. All right, so in the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on some of the key aspects that, um, that happen and that uh, DIGAR does. For example, I will focus on what is the probabilistic model that we train, how do we train this probabilistic model using open source applications, and then how do we deobfuscate applications using, using that probabilistic model. All right, so I'm gonna start with the probabilistic graphical model, and probabilistic, probabilistic graphical models have been used in many other domains uh, with very high success, for example, in uh, computer vision, in speech recognition, and here in DIGART, we use them for the task of deobfuscating Android applications. And let me give you a quick, a quick crash course on how these probabilistic graphical models work. Um, in these graphical models, as the name suggests, you have uh, a graph that is defined over random variables. And in this model, the variables are partitioned into two kinds. So we have known variables, which are variables for which we know the correct names. And we also have unknown variables, which are the ones for which we want to predict the names. And then these variables are connected with different kinds of relationships to capture how these variables are related. So in the case of programs, in the case of programs, these graphs represent, the nodes represent program elements and the graphs, the edges represent different kind of relationships. For example, here we would have, uh, if you look at the piece of code on the top right, we would have one variable that would represent the class A, another one that represents the class SQ light helper, and then we, we would add an edge to represent that the class A extends that, uh, that other class. Okay, so this kind of ed the edges are then associated with um, different uh, feature functions. And what these feature functions do is they define the candidate names that can be assigned to the random variables. And they also define the likelihood of, uh, of, of these names. So for example, here you see on the top, we have uh, two feature functions and they say that we have two options to two possible names that we can assign to the variable A, so we can call it either dbutils, and the likelihood here is represented by the weight of that feature, which is 0 0.3. We can also call it according to the second feature, db helper. Okay, so the graph together with these feature functions defines a probabilistic graphical model, and essentially this model defines a conditional probability that given the names of the, the variable, of, given the names of the known variables or the known program elements, we can compute the probability of any assignment we may give to the obfuscated program elements or the unknown variables. And technically the way this is done is we have to evaluate all the feature functions, we have to multiply them by their weight to compute the exact probability. All right, so if we wanna use this model to deobfuscate applications, if we have an application, we can extract the program elements, we can extract the relationships between them, but we also need to have the feature functions and the weights in order to compute that probability. So the feature functions and their weights are computed during the learning phase. So let me show you how this is done. In the learning phase, we start with a large number of open source applications. So we have unobfuscated Android applications. In the DGAR system, we used over 2,000 applications to train this model. And then we also have feature templates. And these templates, they will define the structure of the feature functions. So they don't concretely instantiate them, but they define, for example, if you have um, subclassing, like in, uh, in, in Java, you would, have a, you would have a template that defines that a class can extend another class. Then in the first step, using static analysis, we derive the graphs that correspond to these unobfuscated applications. So we derive the program elements and their relationships. And then we also instantiate the templates using the data that we have, so using the unobfuscated applications. 
So here are these feature functions that we have instantiated, and this is really a large number. So we know that we start with, uh, in DGuard, we have 28 templates. This gets instanti instantiated into hundreds of thousands uh, concrete feature functions. And these now define concrete names that we can assign to random variables. So we almost have the probabilistic model. What is missing is we don't have the weights for these fe feature functions. This is done in the next step, in a training step, in which we compute weights that maximize the probability that all the, all the applications in our training data are correctly predicted. So because these are unobfuscated applications, we have the correct names for all the program elements, so we can compute the weights in such a way that this probability is maximized. And the output of the learning is the feature functions with, with all the weights associated to these feature functions. All right, so I have told you how the bottom part of the DGARD system works, how we train this probabilistic model, and now I'm going to illustrate how we use this probabilistic model in order to deobfuscate Android applications. So this is done during this pre prediction phase. So here is an end-to-end -end example of this prediction phase. We start with the obfuscated code. You see that some of the variable, some of the program elements have proper names, like SQLite helper, and this is not renamed because it is part of the Android API, while other ones are um, replaced or obfuscated with uh, short non-descriptive names. So first step, we do static analysis, derive the program elements, extract the relationships between these uh, program elements, and know that now since we have, we have the probabilistic model, we know exactly what are the feature functions and weights associated to these edges, okay? And these feature functions now tell us precisely what are the possible name candidates that we can assign to these, to these, uh, to these uh, program elements. So we, can, we have the option of dbutils and dbhelper for the class A, and for the field B that is in this class, we have the options of calling this either db or instance. So we have several possibilities, and in order to predict, to predict what are the mo which are the most likely names, uh, we, we compute a map inference query, and in this map inference query, what it does is it considers, it considers all the possible candidates of names that we can assign to the variables and computes the, the probability for each of these assignments. So in this case, the non-normalized probabilities for these four assignments are, are, are given. And in this case, that's the, that's the candidates that uh, give us the highest probability. So we would choose the name DB helper for the class and the name DB to the, uh, to, to, to the field B. And right, so in, in practice, when you do this for real world Android applications, so this map inference is much more complicated because you would, have, you would be predicting over a graph that has thousands of unknown elements. And in this example, just for illustration, I show a simple example where we have only two program elements with two possible candidate names. Okay, so we, using map inference, we select the most likely names, and as a last step, we can transform the application by plugging in the names that we have just predicted. And this is the output of uh, DGuard on the bottom left part. Okay, so now you have seen a flavor of what's, uh, what's these two kind of, the two kind of phases DGuard and how it performs them. In order to implement the system, we have used various uh, frameworks. So for the static analysis part, which is needed to analyze the application to derive this semantic representation, we used Suit, which is a popular library for uh, static analysis of Java and Android applications. And for the complex part where we have the learning and the map inference, we use the nice to predict framework, which is actually developed in, uh, in our group. And it is a very scalable open source framework for structured prediction. I have put a link here on the website. If you need to solve similar kind of pro problems, I recommend that you check out the link and there's, uh, there are good examples of how to use that framework. And after implementing it in order to train the probabilistic model, as I mentioned, we used the open source applications, about 2,000 of them, and we collected those from the FDroid repository, which is an open source repository for Android applications. All right, so how well, how useful is DGuard in practice? We run a couple of experiments, and the main questions that's, the main kind of security question that we ask in this evaluation are the following. So we wanted to check whether DGuard can, DGuard can reverse ProGuard, where ProGuard is the most popular layout of obfuscation tool for Android. So it actually gets shipped natively with Android Studio, and by default, all the APKs get obfuscated using uh, ProGuard. Um, then we also check whether we can detect third-party libraries using DGuard. Um, 
And as a last question, we wanted to see how useful is DIGART when we try to use it to inspect, uh, to, to reverse engineer malware, to understand how malware works. Okay, so starting by, with the first question, with the ProGuard experiment, here we wanted to, uh, to generate data for that experiment. We did the following, so we took the source code of uh, uh, 100 uh, Android applications, and we made sure that these applications were not part of the training set. And then we compiled two different versions of the application. So we compiled a non-obfuscated version using non normal compilation and an obfuscated version of the application using ProGuard. Then in the, uh, in the obfuscated APK, we feed this one into DGuard in order to deobfuscate it. And this gives us the deobfuscated version of the application. And finally, to check how well DGuard predicts the names, we compare the names that DGuards assigned in the deobfuscated APK with those that were uh, that those, with those that are contained in a non-obfuscated APK. So if those match, then DGuard can successfully recover the original names. So going to the data, so here you see data about uh, the program elements after obfuscation with ProGuard. So it shows what percentage of the program elements have correct names after they have been obfuscated with ProGuard. And we have different bars that show information about the different kinds of program elements. So we have for fields, methods, classes. The right most uh, column shows the, the, overall, uh, the overall data for all the program elements. And the summary here is we see that after obfuscation, only 30% of the names remain in the Android application. So everything else is stripped with short names. After the obfuscating these applications with uh, DGuard, we get the following data. So here now we have, there are two additional segments. The green one shows the program elements that DGuard correctly predicts. So it predicts correctly, meaning that they, it recovers the original names that were in the source code. And the red segment shows the elements where DGuard predicted, but it didn't do the correct prediction. And we see that, uh, I mean, first we see on the, on the rightmost bar that starting from 13%, roughly 80% of the names are recovered and identical to the original ones. And we see that there are some quite significant uh, changes for, if you look at the breakdown for, uh, for different program elements, we see that for fields, initially after obfuscation, we had only 1.6% of the names, and after the obfuscation, this jumps to 80.6%, which is quite significant. Another observation that we can make is we see that uh, actually DGARD is most accurate to predict package names. And this is interesting and very useful because using the original package names, you can predict what are the third party libraries that are imported in the application. <coughs> so let me show you how, how this works. Um, so yes, when ProGuard obfuscates an Android application, it takes as input the source code of that application as well as the library code, and it would obfuscate all the code, so it would replace all the package names. And this is why in the obfuscated APK, we cannot simply see and distinguish which, co which code is library specific, which code is application specific, from which library this code comes from, and so on. However, after we, de we, de we deobfuscate the, uh, uh, the application with DGuard, we can simply check if the package names belong to, the package name, the deobfuscated package names belong to a library package name. And if this is the case, then we know that this was actually part, that a particular library was part and used in the application. So in this experiment, the accuracy was, uh, the we got precision of 93.1%, and recall was also quite high, 91%. And this means that DGuard is quite effective at predicting and detecting such kind of third-party libraries in Android applications. Okay, going to the last experiment. So here we're interested in um, answering the question, is DGuard useful when we inspect malware? And to answer this question, what we did is we took a lot of different Android applications uh, from the Android Malware Genome Project. And then we run them through DGuard to, to deobfuscate their code. And in these experiments, we don't know what is the exact accuracy because we don't have the original source code for, for the malware samples that we got. But instead, what we did is we manually inspected the samples. And we found for which cases where DGuard is successful and where it's not. So I'm going to share a couple of uh, uh, findings that we discovered during this process. So in one thing we discovered is that DGuard was quite successful at revealing string decoders, and this is what the example on this slide shows. So on the left you see the code for a malware sample, and on the right the deobfuscation. So if you look at the code on the left, it is very difficult to understand what's going on. So we have a class D, we have some fields A, met uh, methods A, 
um, after the obfuscation, we see that this is actually a class that is called base64, and there's a method called decode. So obviously, this is a class that decodes strings that are encoded using base64. And finding where, s where such string decoders are and what kind of decoders are is quite useful when you inspect malware because malware often obfuscates the strings, for example, if it has strings that represent a command or some code that will get executed. This is very commonly done by, by malware. Another useful thing, very often DGARD managed to find where are the classes and the methods that handle sensitive data, like location. And this means that if you want to inspect the code and where this kind of data is handled, you can simply grab the deobfuscated code for the appropriate, for, for the appropriate identifiers and then investigate that piece of code. And we also observed cases where the malware was really heavily obfuscated, so cases where we, the malware used reflection, control flow, obfuscation, uh, code unfolding, and these go beyond the, what, beyond the scope of DGARD. So, um, yeah, these were the cases where it didn't quite help in uh, reverse engineering these pieces of malware. All right, with this I'm uh, about to conclude. So, in this work we presented DGARD, which is a statistical system for deobfuscating Android applications. Our system is publicly available at uh, apkdgar.com, so I urge you to, to check it out. Uh, what makes what makes DGARD possible, at this layout of the obfuscation possible, is this probabilistic model that we learn from large amounts of code, large amounts of open source applications. And we show that with this work is that with this kind of probabilistic models, we can, with very high accuracy, do the process of uh, reversing layout obfuscation. So with this I conclude that here I have put a link on uh, that where you can find more information about this project and other related projects like the Nice to Predict project. And if you're interested in this kind of, this line of research, we're looking at many possible extensions like uh, how do we have more robust features, for example, to have better handling of malware and, and so on. So if you're interested in any of this, just you can talk to me or find information on this uh, website. Thank you very much. Questions? Oh, they took your slides away. I don't know if it's possible for you to go back to a certain slide. I can if, um, can you turn on the slides, please? Uh, I'll begin the question, though, uh, regardless. <clears throat> uh, you showed an example where you had uh, a near tie. Uh, I think it was the DB helper example. You were looking for what the original name had been. Mm -hmm. Do you really need to match the exact original name? Could you have something generic that says variable that helps with database? Uh, that, that's all I need as a reverse engineer. Mm -hmm. What is the motivation to have exactly the same name that the original application had? Sure, that's a very good question. Thanks. Uh, so the only reason we use this to measure the accuracy is because we wanted something very objective that we can precisely check and say this is the number. We get 80% or whatever. And uh, otherwise, we had to, but of course, in practice, you don't need exactly the original main name. It's actually Digard may suggest a better name, right? Uh, and in fact, this is the case because we checked. So this is, in a way, a lower bound on how effective uh, Digard is. And when we inspected the mispredictions, very often there were names that were quite close, like uh, database versus DB, for example. And uh, yeah, we observed many of these cases. And in terms of what Digard would do, it would do whatever it learns from the, from the, from the open source data. Um, and, and I have a, a suggestion for you, but we can take it offline. Uh, and then another suggestion that I'm comfortable saying here is maybe there could be an interface for having the top two or the top three most likely names and just show that this is either DB helper or it's a DB assistant. Maybe you can decide mm -hmm. which one you think is more relevant. Yeah, this kind of interactive, that would make a lot of sense. That's a very good point. Thank you. Hi, Guillermo Suarez. Thanks for the talk. Um, do you have any intuition of how could you go one step further uh, in dealing with uh, more forms of obfuscation, such as reflection, as you mentioned in your talk? Yes. So, uh, I mean, obfuscation is really, if you look at, a, look at it as a broad problem, it's a very complex problem where you have really many layers. You have control flow obfuscation, encryption, class encryption, string encryption. Um, so DGARD focuses on one particular kind of obfuscation, layout obfuscation, uh, which is, by the way, one of the obfuscation mechanism that is most very common, so this is applied by virtually all obfuscators. So these other ones usually would tackle a different kind of approach. You can still leverage the basic ideas behind uh, how to leverage open source data in order to do this uh, in a statistical probabilistic way, but it would be a rather different approach, yes. Um, Johannes Kinder, Royal Holloway, University of London. 
Um, so this seems to work really well with libraries in particular. So I was wondering whether you had a breakdown of the accuracy for non-library code. So I was, I'm expecting the performance to drop where code hasn't been seen in that form. Yeah, so, so I, I don't have concrete numbers to tell you, but we have looked at uh, the difference between program-specific and library-specific code manually. And this is where this appears, where you have names that are similar, like database and DBR instance, where we get mispredictions. And it's, it's, it is correct that the accuracy is usually higher on, on library code, but on, on application-specific code, it is also, I mean, the suggestions are still meaningful, but often not exactly the same ones as those in the original source code. Let's thank the speaker again. All right, our last speaker today is Zarek Dury. He's going to be uh, expanding on this topic of 